Section seven of Tales of the Uneasy by Violet Hunt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Lisa Reichert. The Prayer, Part two. Four. Mem. To go and see Mrs. Arne. The doctor came across this note in his blotting pad one day six weeks later. His daughter was out of town. He had heard nothing of the Arnes since her departure. He had promised to go and see her. He was a little conscience-stricken. Yet another week elapsed before he found time to call upon the daughter of his old tutor. At the corner of Tite Street he met Mrs. Arne's husband and stopped. A doctor's professional kindliness of manner is, or ought to be, independent of his personal likings and dislikings. And there was a pleasant cordiality about his greeting, which should have provoked a corresponding fervour on the part of Edward Arne. "'How are you, Arne?' Graham said. "'I was on my way to call on your wife.' "'Ah, yes,' said Edward Arne, with the ascending inflection of polite acquiescence. A ray of blue from his eyes rested transitorily on the doctor's face, and in that short moment the latter noted its intolerable vacuity, and for the first time in his life felt a sharp pang of sympathy for the wife of such a husband. "'I suppose you are off to your club? Uh, good-bye,' he wound up abruptly. With the best will in the world he somehow found it almost impossible to carry on a conversation with Edward Arne, who raised his hand to his hat-brim in token of salutation, smiled sweetly, and walked on. "'He really is extraordinarily good-looking,' reflected the doctor, as he watched him down the street and safely over the crossing with a certain degree of solicitude for which he could not exactly account. And yet one feels one's vitality ebbing out at the finger-ends as one talks to him. I shall begin to believe in Esther's absurd fancies about him soon. Ah, there's the little girl, he exclaimed as he turned into Shane Walk and caught sight of her with her nurse, making violent demonstrations to attract his attention. She is alive at any rate. How's your mother, Dolly? he asked. Quite well, thank you, was the child's reply. She added, She's crying. She sent me away because I looked at her. So I did. Her cheeks are quite red. Run away, run away and play, said the doctor nervously. He ascended the steps of the house and rang the bell very gently and neatly. Not at began Foster, with the intonation of polite falsehood, but stopped on seeing the doctor, who, with his daughter, was a privileged person. Mrs. Arne will see you, sir. Mrs. Arne is not alone? he said interrogatively. Yes, sir, quite alone. I have just taken tea in. Dr. Graham's doubts were prompted by the low murmur as of a voice, or voices, which came to him through the open door of the room at the head of the stairs. He paused and listened, while Foster stood by, merely remarking, "'Mrs. Arne, do talk to herself sometimes, sir.' It was Mrs. Arne's voice. The doctor recognized it now. It was not the voice of a sane or healthy woman. He at once mentally removed his visit from the category of a morning call, and prepared for a semi-professional inquiry. "'Don't announce me,' he said to Foster, and quietly entered the back drawing-room which was separated by a heavy tapestry portiere from the room where Mrs. Arne sat, with an open book on the table before her, from which she had been apparently reading aloud. Her hands were now clasped tightly over her face, and when presently she removed them and began feverishly to turn page after page of her book, the crimson of her cheeks was seamed with white.' where her fingers had impressed themselves. The doctor wondered if she saw him, for though her eyes were fixed in his direction, there was no apprehension in them. She went on reading, and it was the text, mingled with passionate interjection and fragmentary utterances, of the burial service that met his ears. For as in Adam all die, all die, it says all, for he must reign, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. What shall they do if the dead rise? Not at all. I die daily, daily. No, no, better get it over, dead and buried, out of sight, out of mind, under a stone. Dead men don't come back. 
Go on, get it over. I want to hear the earth rattle on the coffin, and then I shall know it is done. Flesh and blood cannot inherit. Oh, what did I do? What have I done? Why did I wish it so fervently? Why did I pray for it so earnestly? God gave me my wish. Alice, Alice, groaned the doctor. She looked up. When this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, dust to dust, ashes to ashes, earth to earth, yes, that is it. After death, though worms destroy this body, she flung the book aside and sobbed. That is what I was afraid of. My God, my God, down there in the dark, for ever and ever and ever, I could not bear to think of it. My Edward, and so I interfered, and prayed, and prayed till, oh, I am punished, flesh and blood could not inherit. I kept him there, I would not let him go. I kept him, I prayed, I denied him Christian burial. Oh, how could I know? Good heavens, Alice, said Graham, coming sensibly forward, what does this mean? I have heard of schoolgirls going through the marriage service by themselves, but the burial service? He laid down his hat and went on severely. What have you to do with such things? Your child is flourishing, your husband alive and here. And who kept him here? interrupted Alice Arne fiercely, accepting the fact of his appearance without comment. You did, he answered quickly, with your care and tenderness. I believe the warmth of your body, as you lay beside him for that half-hour, maintained the vital heat during that extraordinary suspension of the heart's action, which made us all give him up for dead. You were his best doctor, and brought him back to us. Yes, it was I, it was I. You need not tell me it was I. Come, be thankful, he said cheerfully. Put that book away and give me some tea. I'm very cold. Oh, Dr. Graham, how thoughtless of me, said Mrs. Arne, rallying at the slight imputation on her politeness he had purposely made. She tottered to the bell and rang it before he could anticipate her. Another cup, she said quite calmly to Foster, who answered it. Then she sat down, quivering all over with the suddenness of the constraint put upon her. "'Yes, sit down, and tell me all about it,' said Dr. Graham, good-humouredly, at the same time observing her with the closeness he gave to difficult cases. "'There is nothing to tell,' she said simply, shaking her head and futilely altering the position of the teacups on the tray. "'It all happened years ago. Nothing can be done now. Will you have sugar?' He drank his tea and made conversation. He talked to her of some Dante lectures she was attending, of some details connected with her child's kindergarten classes. These subjects did not interest her. There was a subject she wished to discuss. He could see that a question trembled on her tongue, and tried to lead up to it. She introduced it herself quite quietly, over a second cup. "'Sugar, Dr. Graham? I forget. Dr. Graham, tell me, do you believe that prayers—' wicked unreasonable prayers are granted he helped himself to another slice of bread and butter before answering well he said slowly it seems hard to believe that every fool who has a voice to pray with and a brain where to conceive idiotic requests with should be permitted to interfere with the economy of the universe as a rule if people were long-sighted enough to see the result of their petitions I fancy very few of us would venture to interfere. Mrs. Arne groaned. She was a good churchwoman, Graham knew, and he did not wish to sap her faith in any way, so he said no more, but inwardly wondered if a too rigid interpretation of some of the religious dogmas of the vicar of St. Adhelm's, her spiritual adviser, was not the clue to her distress. Then she put another question. Eh, what? he said. Do I believe in ghosts? I will believe if you will tell me you have seen one. You know, doctor, she went on, I was always afraid of ghosts, of spirits, things unseen. I couldn't ever read about them. 
I could not bear the idea of someone in the room with me that I could not see. There was a text that always frightened me that hung up in my room. Thou, God, seest me. It frightened me when I was a child, whether I had been doing wrong or not. But now, shuddering, I think there are worse things than ghosts. Well, now, what sort of things? he asked good-humouredly. Astral bodies? She leaned forward and laid her hot hand on his. Oh, doctor, tell me, if a spirit, without the body we know it by, is terrible, what of the body? Her voice sank to a whisper. A body, senseless, lonely, stranded on this earth, without a spirit. She was watching his face anxiously. He was divided between a morbid inclination to laugh and the feeling of intense discomfort provoked by this wretched scene. He longed to give the conversation a more cheerful turn, yet did not wish to offend her by changing it too abruptly. "'I have heard of people not being able to keep body and soul together,' he replied at last. "'But I am not aware that practically such a division of forces has ever been achieved.' And if we could only accept the theory of the despiritualized body, what a number of antipathetic people now wandering about in the world it would account for. The piteous gaze of her eyes seemed to seek to ward off the blow of his misplaced jocularity. He left his seat and sat down on the couch beside her. Poor child, poor girl, you are ill. You are overexcited. What is it? Tell me he asked her as tenderly as the father she had lost in early life might have done. Her head sank on his shoulder. "'Are you unhappy?' he asked her gently. "'Yes.' "'You are too much alone. Get your mother or your sister to come and stay with you.' "'They won't come,' she wailed. "'They say the house is like a grave. Edward has made himself a study in the basement. It's an impossible room.' but he has moved all his things in, and I can't, I won't go to him there. You're wrong, for it's only a fad, said Graham. He'll tire of it. And you must see more people somehow. It's a pity my daughter is away. Had you any visitors today? Not a soul has crossed the threshold for eighteen days. We must change all that, said the doctor vaguely. Meantime, you must cheer up. Why, you have no need to think of ghosts and graves, no need to be melancholy. You have your husband and your child. I have my child, yes. The doctor took hold of Mrs. Arne by the shoulder and held her a little away from him. He thought he had found the cause of her trouble, a more commonplace one than he had supposed. I have known you, Alice, since you were a child, he said gravely. Answer me. You love your husband, don't you? Yes. It was as if she were answering futile prefatory questions in the witness box. Yet he saw by the intense excitement in her eyes that he had come to the point she feared and yet desired to bring forward. And he loves you? She was silent. Well, then, if you love each other, what more can you want? Why do you say you have only your child in that absurd way? She was still silent, and he gave her a little shake. Tell me, have you and he had any differences lately? Is there any coldness, any temporary estrangement between you? He was hardly prepared for the burst of foolish laughter that proceeded from the demure Mrs. Arne as she rose and confronted him, all the blood in her body seeming for the moment to rush to her usually pale cheeks. Coldness! temporary estrangement if that were all oh is every one blind but me there is all the world between us all the difference between this world and the next she sat down again beside the doctor and whispered in his ear and her words were like a breath of hot wind from some gehenna of the soul oh doctor i have borne it for six years and i must speak no other woman could bear what I have borne, and yet be alive. And I loved him so. You don't know how I loved him. That was it. That was my crime. Crime? repeated the doctor. Yes, crime. It was impious, don't you see? 
but I have been punished. Oh, doctor, you don't know what my life is. Listen, listen, I must tell you. To live with a... At first, before I guessed, when I used to put my arms round him, and he merely submitted, and then it dawned on me what I was kissing. It is enough to turn a living woman into stone, for I am living, though sometimes I forget it. Yes, I am a live woman, though I live in a grave. Think what it is, to wonder every night if you will be alive in the morning, to lie down every night in an open grave, to smell death in every corner, every room, to breathe death, to touch it. The portiere in front of the door shook. A hoop-stick parted it. A round white-clad bundle, supported in a pair of mottled red legs, peeped in, pushing a hoop in front of her. The child made no noise. Mrs. Arne seemed to have heard her, however. She slewed round violently as she sat on the sofa beside Dr. Graham, leaving her hot hands clasped in his. "'You ask Dolly!' she exclaimed. "'She knows it, too. She feels it.' "'No, no, Alice, this won't do,' the doctor adjured her very low. Then he raised his voice and ordered the child from the room. He had managed to lift Mrs. Arne's feet and laid her full length on the sofa by the time the maid reappeared. She had fainted. He pulled down her eyelids and satisfied himself as to certain facts he had up till now dimly apprehended. When Mrs. Arne's maid returned, he gave her mistress over to her care and proceeded to Edward Arne's new study in the basement. "'Morphia!' he muttered to himself, as he stumbled and faltered through gaslit passages where furtive servants eyed him and scuttled to their burrows. "'What is he burying himself down here for?' he thought. "'Is it to get out of her way? "'They are a nervous pair of them.' Arne was sunk in a large armchair drawn up before the fire. There was no other light except a faint reflection from the gas lamp in the road, striking down past the iron bars of the window that was sunk below the level of the street. The room was comfortless and empty. There was little furniture in it except a large bookcase at Arne's right hand and a table with a tantalus on it standing some way off. There was a faded portrait in pastel of Alice Arne over the mantelpiece, and beside it a poor pendant, a pen-and-ink sketch of the master of the house. They were quite discrepant, in size and medium, but they appeared to look at each other with the stolid attentiveness of newly married people. "'Seedy Arne?' Graham said. "'Rather, today. Poke the fire for me, will you?' "'I've known you quite seven years,' said the doctor cheerfully, "'so I presume I can do that. "'There now. "'And I'll presume further. "'What have we got here?' He took a small bottle smartly out of Edward Arne's fingers and raised his eyebrows. Edward Arne had rendered it up agreeably. He did not seem upset or annoyed. "'Morphia. "'It isn't a habit. "'I only got hold of the stuff yesterday. "'Found it about the house.' Alice was very jumpy all day, and communicated her nerves to me, I suppose. I've none, as a rule. But do you know, Graham, I seem to be getting them, feel things a good deal more than I did, and want to talk about them. What, are you growing a soul? said the doctor, carelessly, lighting a cigarette. Heaven forbid, Arne answered equably. I've done very well without it all these years but I'm fond of old Alice, you know, in my own way. When I was a young man, I was quite different. I took things hardly, and got excited about them. Yes, excited. I was wild about Alice. Wild. Yes, by Jove, though she has forgotten all about it. Not that, but still it's natural she should long for some little demonstration of affection now and then, and she'd be awfully distressed if she saw you fooling with that bottle of morphia. You know, Arne, after that narrow squeak you had of it five years ago, Alice and I have a good right to consider that your life belongs to us. Edward Arne settled in his chair and replied rather fretfully, Oh, very well, but you didn't manage to do the job thoroughly. You didn't turn me out lively enough to please Alice. She's annoyed because when I take her in my arms I don't hold her tight enough. I'm too quiet, too languid. Hang it all, Graham. I believe she'd like me to stand for Parliament. 
why can't she let me just go along my own way surely a man who's come through an illness like mine can be let off parlour tricks all this worry it culminated the other day when i said i wanted to colonize a room down here and did with a spurt that took it out of me horribly all this worry i say seeing her upset and so on keeps me low and so i feel as if i wanted to take drugs to soothe me soothe said graham this stuff is more than soothing if you take enough of it i'll send you something more like what you want and i'll take this away by your leave i really can't argue replied arne if you see alice tell her you find me fairly comfortable and don't put her off this room i really like it best she can come and see me here i keep a good fire tell her i feel as if i wanted to sleep he added brusquely you have been indulging already said graham softly arne had begun to doze off his cushion had sagged down and the doctor stooped to rearrange it carelessly laying the little file for the moment in a crease of the rug covering the man's knees mrs arne in her morning dress was crossing the hall as he came to the top of the basement steps and pushed open the swing door she was giving some orders to foster the butler who disappeared as the doctor advanced you're about again he said good girl too silly of me she said to be hysterical after all these years one should be able to keep one's own counsel but it's over now i promise i'll never speak of it again we frightened poor dolly dreadfully i had to order her out like a regiment of soldiers yes yes i know i'm going to her now on his suggestion that she should look in on her husband first she looked askance down there yes that's his fancy let him be he's a good deal depressed about himself and you he notices a great deal more than you think he isn't quite as apathetic as you describe him to be come here he led her into the unlit dining-room a little way you expect too much my dear you do really you make too many demands on the vitality you saved what did one save him for she asked fiercely she continued more quietly i know i'm going to be different not you said graham fondly he was very partial to alice arne in spite of her silliness you'll worry about edward till the end of the chapter i know you and he turned her round by the shoulder so that she fronted the light in the hall you elusive thing let me have a good look at you hm your eyes they're a bit starey he let her go again with a sigh of impotence something must be done soon he must think he got hold of his coat and began to get into it mrs arne smiled buttoned a button for him and then opened the front door like a good hostess a very little way with a quick flirt of his hat he was gone and she heard the clap of his brougham door and the order home been saying good-bye to that thief graham said her husband gently when she entered his room her pale eyes staring a little her thin hand busy at the front of her dress thief why one moment where's your switch she found it and turned on a blaze of light from which her husband seemed to shrink well he carried off my drops afraid of my poisoning myself i suppose or acquiring the morphia habit said his wife in a dull level voice as i have she paused he made no comment then picking up the little file dr graham had left in the crease of the rug she spoke you are the thief edward as it happens this is mine is it i found it knocking about i didn't know it was yours well will you give me some i will if you like well dear decide you know i am in your hands and graham's he was rubbing that into me to-day poor lamb she said derisively i'd not allow my doctor or my wife either to dictate to me whether i should put an end to myself or not ah but you've got a spirit i see arne yawned however let me have a go at the stuff and then you put it on top of the wardrobe or a shelf where i shall know it is but never reach out to get it i promise you no you wouldn't reach out a hand to keep yourself alive let alone kill yourself said she that is you all over edward and don't you see that is why i did die 
he said, with earnestness unexpected by her. And then, unfortunately, you and Graham bustled up and wouldn't let nature take its course. I rather wish you hadn't been so officious. And let you stay dead, said she carelessly. But at the time I cared for you so much that I should have had to kill myself, or commit sooty like a Bengali widow. Ah, well. She reached out for a glass half full of water that stood on the low ledge of a bookcase close by the arm of his chair. Will this glass do? What's in it? Only water? How much morphia shall I give you? An overdose? I don't care if you do, and that's a fact. It was a joke, Edward, she said piteously. No joke to me. This fag end of life I've clawed hold of doesn't interest me, and I'm bound to be interested in what I'm doing or I'm no good. I'm no earthly good now. I don't enjoy life. I've nothing to enjoy it with. In here, he struck his breast. It's like a dull party one goes to by accident. All I want to do is get into a cab and go home. His wife stood over him with the half-full glass in one hand and the little bottle in the other. Her eyes dilated, her chest heaved. Edward, she breathed, was it all so useless? Was what useless? Yes, as I was telling you, I go as one in a dream, a bad, bad dream, like the dreams I used to have when I overworked at college. I was brilliant, Alice, brilliant, do you hear? At some cost, I expect. Now I hate people, my fellow creatures. I've left them. They come and go, jostling me and pushing me on the pavements as I go along avoiding them. Do you know where they should be, really, in relation to me? He rose a little in his seat. She stepped nervously aside, made as if to put down the bottle and the glass she was holding, then thought better of it and continued to extend them mechanically. They should be over my head. I've already left them in their petty nonsense of living. They mean nothing to me, no more than if they were ghosts walking. Or perhaps it's I who am a ghost to them. You don't understand it. It's because I suppose you have no imagination. You just know what you want and do your best to get it. You blurt out your blessed petition to your deity, and the idea that you're irrelevant never enters your head, soft, persistent, high church thing that you are. Alice Arne smiled and balanced the object she was holding. He motioned her to pour out the liquid from one to the other, but she took no heed. She was listening with all her ears. It was the nearest approach to the language of compliment, to anything in the way of lover-like personalities that she had heard fall from his lips since his illness. He went on, becoming, as it were, lukewarm to his subject. But the worst of it is that once break the cord that links you to humanity, it can't be mended. Man doesn't live by bread alone, or lives to disappoint you. What am I to you without my own poor personality? Don't stare so, Alice. I haven't talked so much or so intimately for ages, have I? Let me try and have it out. Are you in any sort of hurry? No, Edward. Pour that stuff out and have done. Well, Alice, it's a queer feeling, I tell you. One goes about with one's looks on the ground, like a man who eyes the bed he is going to lie down in and longs for. Alice, the crust of the earth seems a barrier between me and my own place. I want to scratch the boards with my nails and shriek something like this. Let me get down to you all, there where I belong. It's a terrible sensation, like a vampire reversed. Is that why you insisted on having this room in the basement? she asked breathlessly. Yes, I can't bear being upstairs somehow. Here, with these barred windows and stone-cold floors, I can see the people's feet walking above there in the street. One has some sort of illusion. Oh! she shivered, and her eyes travelled like those of a caged creature round the bare room and fluttered where they rested on the sombre windows, imperiously barred. She dropped her gaze to the stone flags that showed beyond the oasis of turkey carpet on which Arne's chair stood. 
then to the door, the door that she had closed on entering. It had heavy bolts, but they were not drawn against her, though by the look of her eyes it seemed she half imagined they were. She made a step forward and moved her hands slightly. She looked down on them in what they held, then changed the relative positions of the two objects and held the bottle over the glass. "'Yes, come along,' her husband said. "'Are you going to be all day giving it to me?' With a jerk she poured the liquid out into a glass and handed it to him. She looked away towards the door. "'Ah, your way of escape,' said he, following her eyes. Then he drank painstakingly. The empty bottle fell out of her hands. She wrung them, murmuring, "'Oh, if I had only known!' "'Known what? That I should go near to cursing you for bringing me back?' He fixed his cold eyes on her, as the liquid passed slowly over his tongue. "'Or that you would end by taking back the gift you gave.'" End of section 7section eight of tales of the uneasy by violet hunt this librivox recording is in the public domain read by lisa reichert the coach it was a lonely part of the country far north where the summer nights are pale and light and scant of shade this summer night there was no moon and yet it was not dark for hours the flat deprecating earth had lain prone under a storm of wind and rain its patient surface was drenched, blanched, smitten into blindness. The tumbled waters of the firth splashed on the edges of the plain, their wild commotion dwarfed by the noise of the wind-driven showers, whose gloomy drops tapped the waters into sullen acquiescence. Half a mile inland the road to the north was laid. Clear and straight it ran, with never a house or homestead to break it, viscous with clay here, shining with quartz there, uncompromising, exact, like the lists of old, dressed for a tourney. Its sides were bare, scantily garnished with grass. This was nearly a hedgeless country. In places the undeviating line of it passed through a little coppice or clump of gnarled, ill-conditioned, nameless trees. These seemed to lean forward vindictively on either side, snapping their horny fingers at each other, waving their cantankerous branches as the gusts took them, broke them, and whirled the fragments of their ruin far away and out of ken, like a flapping, unruly kite which a child has allowed to pass beyond his control. The broad white surface of the road was not suffered to be blotted for a single moment, nothing could rest for the play of the intriguing air-currents surging backwards and forwards blind stupid and swelled with pride till they had got completely out of hand and defied the archers of the middle sky they staggered hither and thither like ineffectual giants they buffeted all impartially they instigated the hapless branches at their mercy to wild lashings of each other to useless accesses of the spirit of self-destruction. Bending slavishly under the heavy gusts, each shabby blade of grass by the roadside rose again and was on the qui vive after the rustling tyrant had passed. It was then, in the succeeding moments of comparative peace, when the directors of the passionate aerial revolt had managed to call their panting rabble off for the time, that great perpendicular sheets of rain, like stage films, slung evenly from heavenly temples, descended and began moving continuously sideways, like a wall, across the level track. A sheet of whole water, blotting out the tangled borders of herbage that grew sparsely round the heaps of stones with which the margin was set at intervals, placed there ready for breaking. When the slab of rain had moved on again, the broad road, shining out sturdily with its embedded quartz and milky kneaded clay, lay clear once more. Calm, ordered, and tranquil in the midst of tumult and discord, it pursued its appointed course, edging off from its evenly beveled sides the noisy moorland streams that had come jostling each other in their haste to reach it, 
only to be relegated, noisily complaining, to the swollen, unrecognizable gutter. At a certain point on the line of way, a tall, spare, respectable-looking man in a well-fitting grey frock-coat stood waiting. The rain ran down the back of his coat-collar and dripped off the rim of his tall hat. His attitude suggested some weary, foredone clerk waiting at the corner of the city street for the omnibus that was to carry him home to his slippered comfort and sober pipe of peace. He wore no muffler, but then it was summer, St. John's Eve. He leaned on an ivory-headed ebony stick of which he seemed fond, and peered, not very eagerly, along the road, which now lay in dazzling rain-washed clarity under the struggling moon. There was a lull in the storm. He had no luggage, no umbrella, yet his grey coat looked neat and his hat shiny. Far in the distance from the south a black, clumsy object appeared, labouring slowly along. It was a coach of heavy and antique pattern. As soon as he had sighted it the passenger's faint interest seemed diminished. With a bored air of fulfilment he dropped his eyes and looked down disapprovingly at the clayey mud at his feet, although, indeed, the sticky substance did not appear to have marred the exquisite polish of his shoes. His palm settled composedly on the ivory knob of his trusty stick as though it were the hand of an old friend. With all the signs of difficult going, but no noise of straining or grinding, the coach at last drew up in front of the expectant stranger. He looked up quietly and recognized it as the vehicle wherein it was appointed that he should travel, in this unsuitable weather, for a stage or two, maybe. All was correct, the coachman, grave, business-like, headless as of usage, the horse long-tailed, black, conventional. The door opened noiselessly and the step was let down. The passenger shook his head as he delicately put his foot on to it, and observed for the benefit, doubtless, of the person or persons inside, "'I see old Joe on the box in his official trim. Rather unnecessary, all this ceremony, I venture to think. A few yokels and old women to impress, if indeed any one, not positively obliged, is abroad on a night like this. For form's sake, I suppose.' He took his seat next to the window. There were four occupants of the coach beside himself. They all nodded formally, but not unkindly. He returned their salutations with old-fashioned courtesy, though unacquainted seemingly with any of them. Sitting next to him was a woman evidently of fashion. Her heavy and valuable furs were negligently cast on one side, to show a plastron covered with jewels. She wore at least two enameled and jewel-encrusted watches pinned to her bosom, as a mark for thieves to covet. It was foolish of her. So at least thought the man in the grey frock coat. Her yellow wig was much awry. Her eyes were weak, strained, and fearful, and she aided their vision with a diamond beset pin's ness. Now and again she glanced over her left shoulder, as if in some alarm, and at such times she always grasped her gold net reticule feverishly. She was obviously a rich woman in the world, a first-class, train de luxe passenger. The woman opposite her belonged as unmistakably to the people. She was hard-featured, worn with a life of sordid toil and calculation, but withal stout and motherly, a figure to inspire the fullest confidence. She wore a black bonnet with strings, and black silk gloves heavily darned. Round her sunken white collar a golden gleam of watch-chain was now and then discernible. At the other end of the coach, squeezed up into the corner, where the vacillating light of the lamp hung from the roof least penetrated, a neat, sharp-featured man nestled and hid. His forehead retreated, and his bowler hat was sat unnecessarily far back, lending him an air of folly and congenital weakness which his long, cold, clever nose could not dissipate. He was white as old enamel. But the man whom the gentleman in the frock coat took to among his casual fellow travellers was the one sitting directly opposite him, a rough, hearty creature, who alone of all the taciturn coachful seemed disposed to enter into casual conversation, which might go some way to enliven the dreariness entailed by this somewhat old-fashioned mode of travelling. 
gay talk might help to drown the dashing of the waters of the firth lying close on the right hand of the section of road they were even now traversing and the ugly roar of the wind and rain against the windows this by comparison cheerful fellow was dressed like a working man in a shabby suit of corduroys he wore no collar but a twisted red cotton handkerchief was wound tightly round his thick squat neck his little mean eyes swinish but twinkling good-humouredly stared enviously at the neat gentleman's stiff collar and the delicate grey tones of his suiting crossing and uncrossing his creasy legs in the unusual effort of an attempt at conviviality the man in corduroys addressed the man in the frock coat awkwardly enough but still civilly well mate the chosen a rare rough night to shift on us orders from headquarters i suppose i've been here nigh on a year and never set eyes on my boss we used to call him god the father said the elder man slowly but whoever it is that orders our ways here there is no earthly sense in questioning his arrangements we can only fall in with them as you admit you are fairly new and perhaps you do not as yet conceive fully of the silent impelling force that sways us it is the same in the world we have left only that there we were only concerned with the titles and standing of our boss as you call him and obeyed his laws not a whit i must say i consider this particular system of soul transference that we have to submit to very unsettling and productive of restlessness among us a mere survival and tiresome superstition to my mind it has one merit one sees something of the underworld travelling about as we do and meeting chance perhaps kindred spirits on the road one realises too that hades is not quite as grey shall i say as it is painted but perhaps he added with a slight touch of class hauteur you do not quite follow me oh yes master i do eagerly replied the fellow-traveller to whom he chose to address his monologue since i've been dead i have learned the meaning of many things i turn up my nose at nothing these days i always neglected my schooling but now i tell you i try to make up for lost time from a rough sort of fellow that i was with not an idea in my head beyond my beer and my prog i have come to take my part in the whole of knowledge it was all mine before so to speak but i didn't trouble to put my hand out for it didn't care didn't listen to miss that taught me or to parson either he had some good ideas too as i've come to know though vice isn't vice exactly with us here now in a manner of speaking if god almighty made us why did he make us even in parts bad that's what i want to know and i'll know that when i've been dead a bit longer why did he give me rotten teeth so that i couldn't chew properly and didn't care for my food and liked my drink better it's dirt and digestion makes drinking and devilry i say the smart woman interrupted him with a kind of languid eagerness exclaiming i must say i agree with you since the pestle fell on my shoulder in that lonely villa at monte i have realized what the dreadful gambling fever may lead to it had made those two who treated me so ill quite inhuman they had become wild beasts i ought never to have accepted their treacherous invitation to luncheon never tempted them with my outrageous display of jewels and look here i was tarred with the same stick i gambled too she rummaged in her reticule and fished out a ticket for the rooms at monte carlo i always call that the ticket for my execution though my executioners were rather unnecessarily brutal they will attain unto this place more easily than i did hardly any pain the hand of the law is gentle compared with the methods of the man in the grey frock coat raised his finger warningly no names i beg one of our conventions have a drop said the calm motherly woman to the excited fine lady your wound is recent isn't it yours was a very severe case a bloody murder i call it if ever there was one and clumsy at that and you only passive which is always so much harder they say i can't tell for i was what you may call an active party they don't seem to mind mixing they that look after us here they lump us all together travelling at any rate though when i think of what i was actually turned off for well the way i look at it 
what i did was a positive benefit to society and some sections of society knew it too and would have liked to preserve my life but what madam if i may ask was your little difficulty it is called i believe baby farming she replied off-handedly receiving her flask back from the smart woman and stowing it away in a capacious pocket as she spoke a shudder like a transitory ripple on a rain-swept stream passed over her hearers with the exception of the thin man in the far corner who preserved his serenity raising his sunken chin he observed the last speaker with some slight show of interest the man in grey apologized excuse us madam a remnant of old-world squeamishness uncontrollable by us for the moment though perhaps if you will you might a little dissipate our preconceived notions of your profession by explaining clearly your point of view delighted i'm sure she answered funny though how seriously you all take it even here the feeling against my profession seems absurdly strong below as well as above i was hooted as i left the court i recollect it annoyed me then considerably i thought that those that hooted had more need to be grateful to me if all was known and paid for i saved their pockets for them and their lovely honour too they knew they owed all that to me but the rest they did not care they went on bless em raising up seed for me to mow down as soon as its head came above the ground and welcome sly dogs no thanks from them but those shivering shrinking women that came to see me some of them hardly out of their teens some of them so delicate they had no right to have a baby at all oh if only i hadn't let myself take their money it would have been a work of pure philanthropy but i had to live then now that that tax has been taking off one has time to think it out all round but lord society to cry shame on me for it they might as well hang any other useful public servant like dustmen rat-catchers and such like ridders of pests good old herod that i used to hear about at school knew what he was doing when he cleared off all those useless innocents he was the first baby farmer i guess you take large ground madam said the man in the frock coat a trifle huffily and i have the right said she her large determined chin emerging from its rolls of fat in her eagerness you men ought to know it and you do well enough when you're honest i was only the scapegoat and took on me the little sins of the race it's an easy job enough what i did but there's few have the stomach for it even then you couldn't call it dirty work either you just stand by and leave em alone to gurn and bleat and squinny and die no blood eh the man in the corner said suddenly i like blood what a fine night it has turned said the man in the grey frock coat raising the sash and putting his head out of the window something rather uncanny eh about that man he remarked under his breath half to himself half to the man in brown corduroys take your head in said the latter almost affectionately or you'll be catching cold and you've a nasty scar on your neck that i could see as you leaned forward and which you oughtn't to go getting the cold into oh that said the other complacently sitting down again but averting his gaze carefully from the man in the corner for whom he seemed to feel a repulsion as marked as was his preference for his cheerful vis-a-vis -vis. that that's actually the scar of the blow that killed me a fearful gash he was a powerful man that dealt it he got me of course from behind i never even saw him i was drafted off here at once his hand had been so sure he felt nervously in his pockets i have a foulard somewhere but i am apt to misplace it you should do like me have a good strong handkerchief and knot it round your neck firm i've got a mark of sorts on my neck too but it isn't an open wound never was the bluff man sniggered it is sheer vanity with me but i don't care to have it seen it goes well all round mine does done by a rope eh he paused and nodded slyly for killing a toff nice old gentleman he seemed too but i hadn't much time to look at him had to get to work he was rudely interrupted by a screech from the baby farmer lor she cried 
do i see another conveyance coming on this lonely road i do hope so i'm one for seeing plenty of people i always like a crowd and i must tell you this sort of humdrum jogging along was beginning to get on my nerves they all jerked themselves round and peered through the glass panes behind them the taciturn man alone reserved his attention sure enough a dark object plainly outlined in the strong moonlight which now lit up the heavens where heavy masses of cloud had until now obscured its effulgence was plainly visible it blotted the ribbons of white that lay in front of them nearer and nearer it came all heads were at the windows of the coach now it was seen to be a high-hung dog-cart of the most modern pattern drawn by a smart little metal pony and containing two slight young girls the one that drove held the ribbons in her hands that were covered with white dogskin gloves and which looked immense in the pallid moonshine what an excitement said the stout woman we shall pass them some member of one of the country families about here i suppose i hope for all things considering i'm not a bloodthirsty man the man in corduroys muttered anxiously under his breath that we're not a-goin to give them a shock bound to when we meet them plumb like this horses can't abide the sight of us mostly no more than they could those nasty motors when they first came in and we're worse than motors they seem to smell us out at once for what we are if you do really think the pony is likely to swerve said the man in the grey suit anxiously would it be of any use our asking our diggory to drive more slowly and humour them couldn't go no slower than we are replied the man in corduroys besides it's not the pace that kills i'll bet you that pony's all of a sweat already the dog-cart approached the faces of the two young women were discernible they were white blanched with fear or it may have been the effect of the strong moonlight there was no doubt that they were disturbed and that the girl who was driving fully realized the necessity of controlling the horse whose nostrils were quivering and on whose sides foam was already appearing in white swaths it won't pass us said the man in the corner speaking suddenly he rubbed his hands slowly one over the other there will be blood for goodness sake stop gloating like that said the stout woman it turns my stomach to hear you wherever can you have come from i wonder tisn't manners i say can't we hail them she inquired of the man in grey i'll give them one big shout they wouldn't be able to hear us he replied shaking his head sadly you must not forget that we are ghosts we are not really here ay and that's what the beasts know cried the man in corduroys he jumped about that oss won't be able to stand it the kid'll not be able to hold him in they're on us screamed the smart woman oh my god do we have to sit still and see it she covered her eyes with her hand yes missus i reckon you have and what's more run away after like any shoffer that's killed his man and left him lying in the roadside old diggory's got his orders the snorting of the pony was now audible the coachful of ghosts distinctly saw the lather of foam dropping from its jaws they were able some of them to realize the agonized tension of one girl's hands pulling for all she was worth and the scared sideways twist of her forcedly inactive companion alone the face of the yellow carriage lamp glared immovable then it flew down and was extinguished there was a crash a convulsion and the great road to the north lay clear again the coach of death rolled on remorselessly past a black heap that filled the ditch on one side it lay quite still after that almost human leap and heave the smart woman fainted or appeared to do so the baby farmer sat silent it's iniquitous exclaimed the man in grey turning round from the window his eyes wet to leave them behind like that without a word of inquiry when it's our conveyance has done all the mischief he groaned and fidgeted the man in corduroys tried to soothe him we ain't to blame sir don't you think it he repeated as you said before to the lady we aren't really here that is little consolation to a man of honour the old man said sadly still as you say we are but tools he devoted himself to the smart woman who revived a little under his civil ministrations 
after all she said aren't we somehow or other all in the same boat i shouldn't be surprised if those two nice girls didn't join us at the next stage if they do we'll make them tell us how they felt when they first saw the coachful of ghosts coming down on them they're certainly dead for they were both pitched into the ditch with the cart and horse on top of them did anybody see what became of the horse no well we must settle down to dullness again i'm afraid or suppose to while away the time we all started to tell each other the story of how we came to be here a lively tale might cheer us all up after the accident agreed madam heartily for my part said the man in grey though my own story is very humdrum and not in the least amusing you want of course an account of the particular accident that sent me here very well but ladies first will not you begin madam there's not much story about the drowning of a litter of squalling puppies or whining kittens said the lady shortly we want something livelier more personal if i may say so from a remark that gentleman in the corner let drop a while ago i fancy his reminiscences would be quite worth hearing as good as a shilling shocker my story replied the individual thus pointedly addressed is impossible frankly impossible indecent do you mean the smart woman's eyes shone oh let us have it you can veil it can't you have you ever heard of mental degenerates he asked her compassionately i was one i was called mad a simple way of expressing it i was a chemist i dissected neatly enough too like a regular butcher they did quite right to exterminate me his head dropped he seemed disinclined to say more still the smart woman persisted but the details are purely medical ma'am not without a physiological interest i may say interesting to men of science pathologically the he named a daily paper much in vogue at that time made a good deal of the strong sense of artistry of contrast the morbid warp inherent in the executant his head sank again on his chest i do believe said the baby farmer nudging the smart woman that we shall find he's the man who killed his sweetheart and then carefully tied her poor inside all into true lover's knots with sky-blue ribbon artist indeed they're quite common colours blue and red disgusting the delicate lady from monte carlo shuddered and turning coldly away joined in the petition proffered by the other ghosts to the breezy man in corduroys to relate his experiences oh i'll tell you how i came to join you and welcome he said rolling his huge neck about in its setting of red cotton well to begin with i was drunk equally of course i was hard up my missus she's married again by the way blast her was always nagging me to do something for her and the kids i did nation's taking care of them now along of what i did work she meant but that was only by the way i did choose to take on a job though on a rich man's estate building some kind of folly lots of glass and that working away day and night by naphtha flares you know he was one of those men you know the sort that has more money than a man can properly spend and feels quite sick about it and says so in interviews and so on in the papers a working man reads that's the mischief he was always giving away chunks of money to charities and libraries and that sort of useless lumber but none of it ever seemed to come the way of those that were in real need of it they said the money had got on his nerves and would not let him sleep o nights and that he was afraid by day and went about with a loaded stick and i didn't know what all and he was looked after by detectives at one time so the papers said again the papers putting things in people's heads as it's their way so one blessed evening i was very low funds and all and my missus and the kids hollering and complaining as they always do when luck's bad lord bless em they never thought as they were sightin their man to murder women never do think and goin out with their snivelling in my ears i passed the station where he landed every evening after his day in town 
and I happened to see him come out of the train and send away his motor that was a-waitin' for him all regular, and start out to walk home alone by a shortcut across a little plantation there was, very thick and dark, just the place for a murder. Well, I told you I was half drunk. I raced home and got something to do it with, a meat chopper to be particular. The old man opposite put his hand nervously to the back of his neck. Ay, mister, it takes you just there, does it? You look a regular bundle of nerves, you do. Well, as I was saying, I went round by a shortcut that I happened to know of, and got in front of him and hid in the hedge. Ten mortal minutes I waited for my man to come by. Lord, how my hand did tremble. I'd have knocked off for twopence. I was as nervous as a cat, but all the same, it didn't prevent me from striking out for wife and children with a will when my chance came. I caught him behind with my chopper, and he fell like a log. Never lifted a hand to defend himself. Hadn't got any grit. Ladies, I don't suppose I heard him much, for he never even cried out when I struck, or groaned when it was done. Then I looked him over, turned out his pockets, and collared his watch, and season ticket, and seals, and money. Money! Ha! I had been fairly done over that. Would you believe it of a rich fellow like him? He hadn't got more than the change of a sovereign on him. "'Shame!' ejaculated the taciturn man in the corner. "'I admit it was hard on you,' the man in grey observed kindly. "'Very hard, for I believe the retribution came all too quickly. You foolishly left your chopper about to identify you, and were apprehended at once by our excellent rural police. Yet the law is so dilatory that you lay in jail a whole year before you were free to join your victim here?' right you are mate yes i swung for it sure enough short and sweet it was once i stood on the drop but it still makes my poor old throat ache to think of it he wriggled and twisted his neck in its ruddy cincture now governor i'm done and if you've no objection we'd all like to hear how you came by that ugly gash of yours it wasn't no rope did that common or garden murder i'll be bound certainly my man it was a murder a murder most apropos. The circumstances were peculiar. I have often longed to get the ear of the jury who tried a man for relieving me of my light purse and intolerably heavy life, and tell them, the whole hard-working, conscientious twelve of them, trying their best to bring in an honest verdict and avenge my wrongs, my own proper feelings, surely no negligible factor in the case, they could not guess, these ignorant living men, whose eyes had not yet been opened by death to a due sense of the proportions of things, that I bore the poor creature no malice, but instead was actually grateful for his skilful surgery that had severed the life-cord that bored me, so neatly and completely. "'It isn't every one would take it like that,' remarked the smart woman. Yet that is, more or less, how I feel about these things myself. Only in my case it is impossible to speak of skilful surgery. I was disgracefully cut up. I couldn't possibly have worn a low dress again. "'Have you ever heard,' said the man in grey thoughtfully, "'of the Greek story of the gold of Rampsinitos, "'and the inviolable cellar he built to store it in? "'According to the modern system,' My gold was hoarded in my brain, where fat assets and sordid securities bred and bred all day long. The laws that govern wealth are hard. You must give it, devise it. You must not allow it to be taken. But for my part, I would have welcomed the two sons of the master builder who broke into the Greek king's treasure house. In the strong room of my brain it lodged, with one careless calculation, one stroke of a pen, I could make money breed money there to madden me. I was lonely, too. I had no wife to divide my responsibilities. She might even have enjoyed them. But I dared approach no woman in the way of love. I did not choose to be loved for my check-signing powers. I was not loved at all. I was hated." unrighteous things were done in my name by the greedy husbandmen of my load of money then i was told that i went in danger of my life and i condescended to take care of that for a time only for a time one dark winter evening 
i forget what had happened during the day what fresh instance of turpitude or greed had come before me i was so revolted that i kicked away all the pulling safeguards by which my agents guarded their best asset of all and gave the rein to my instinct i disregarded precautions of every sort with the exception of my faithful loaded stick and the carrying of that had come to be a mere matter of habit with me and i walked home from the station alone and unattended up to my big house and good dinner which i hoped nay i almost knew that i should not be alive to eat and indeed as luck would have it on that night of all nights the trap was set for me the appointed death-dealer was waiting he took me on at once i got my desire kind speedy merciful violent death i never even saw the face of my deliverer by george softly swore the man in corduroys this beats all are you sure you aren't kidding us no indeed that is exactly how i felt about it and if i had known of knowledge as i knew of instinct what was going to happen i would have thought to realize some of my wealth before setting out to walk through that wood and made it more worth the honest fellow's while but as you are aware a millionaire does not carry portable gold about with him and my cheque-book which i had on me would of course be of no use to him alas all the poor devil got for his pains was exactly nineteen shillings and eleven pence i had changed a sovereign at the bookstall to buy a paper and out of habit had waited for the change the man in corduroys was by this time in a considerable state of excitement he had rent the red handkerchief fiercely from his neck and now made as if to tear it across his knee why governor he exclaimed passionately do you mean to say it was through you that i got this here he put both hands behind his head and interlocked them in return for giving you that there cut on the back of your neck well how things do come about to be sure gently gently my man the elder soothed him don't be so melodramatic about a very ordinary coincidence see the ladies are quite upset it doesn't do to allow oneself to get excited here it's not in the rules if i had made the little discovery you have done i don't think no i really don't think i would have made it public this undue exhibition of emotion of yours strikes me as belonging to the vulgar world we have all left but since you have allowed it to come out and every one is now aware of the peculiar relation in which we stand to each other you must let me tender you my best thanks as to a most skilful and firm operator and believe me to be truly grateful to you for your services in the past quite the old school said the smart woman i must say sir i consider you a real gentleman said the baby farmer i am a gentleman and a fairly accommodating one said the rough man wiping his brow where however no sweat was it isn't every man as would give thanks for being scragged every man isn't a millionaire said the victim calmly the smart woman leaning forward tapped the old gentleman amiably with her jewelled pince-nez but we belong to the same world i believe she said and i am quite able to understand your refined feeling it is as i said in my own case indeed if those two good people who shall be nameless had only dealt with me a little more gently i don't know that i should not forgive them absolutely i shall at any rate be perfectly civil when i do meet them only perhaps a little distant but that monte carlo existence i was leading when they interrupted it was really becoming intolerable no one who hasn't done it thoroughly can realize what it is glare noise glitter fever that heartless blue laughing sea they talk of in the railway advertisements the baby farmer left out in this elegant discussion obviously took no pleasure in it but staring straight before her muttered sulkily cote d'azur and pentonville there's some little difference isn't there between one life and the other 
yet i enjoyed my life i did and as for gratitude i can't say as i see all those blessed infants a coming up to me and slobbering me for what i did for em i may meet them but they'll not notice me it isn't in human nature their mother's thanks was all i got and they thanked me beforehand in hard cash for what i was a-going to do lord what's a rickety baby more or less i say we're slowing up going to stop perhaps and a good thing too yes said the man in the grey frock coat still enouncing his curt sentences to the unheeding listeners i am able to cordially thank the man who rid me with one clean scientific blow of my wretched life and all its tedious accessories a skilled workman is worthy of his hire mercy muttered the baby farmer is he never going to stop if it was for nothing else he ought to have got scragged for being a bore but being fully wound up though in the excitement of arriving at the depot no one was attending the man in grey continued suicide i had thought of but abhorred though on my soul i have nearly come to that and then it was merely a question of courage you spoke truly sir mine was a thin pusillanimous nature as you said you came by a kind samaritan and sacrificed your own good life freely to rid me of my wretched one i think i told you that when you were being tried i followed urgently all the details of the trial and made interest with the authorities here to allow me to appear to the judge in his sleep say and instill into his mind some inkling of the true state of my feelings towards you i do not know however if you would have thanked me for life may have been no sweeter to you than it was to me you spoke of an uncongenial helpmate i think still one never knows i might have been the means of procuring you some good years yet in the full exercise of your undeniable vigour and remarkable decision of character but it was apparently not to be you followed me here after a long interval of waiting and now we have met face to face the introduction on that dark night was worth nothing i like your face we shall probably never meet again their ways are dark and devious here so i am the more glad of this opportunity of opening my mind to you on a delicate subject perhaps but one that has always been very near my heart by the way he lifted his stick with its shining ivory crown into view did you notice this you read the papers you said and they told you it was heavily weighted and that i carried it always as a precaution well on that eventful night for both of us perhaps you were too hurried to notice but i never used it accept it now will you not as a memento i think from sundry truly unearthly bumpings that we seem to have come at last to our journey's end i am right the coachman has got down from his perch and taken his head under his arm we part madame i salute you again sir he addressed himself more particularly to the shamefaced man in corduroys farewell very pleased to have met you one by one the passengers faded away into the distance the polite old man paused in the semblance of an inn-yard where the coach had drawn up a pale proud woman's face shining up by the step had touched him she was an intending passenger and she was alone she wore white dogskin gloves but no hat unusual he fancied in a woman of her class on looking closer he saw that she had a hat but that it hung disregarded over her shoulder by an elastic and was much battered and destroyed he decided to speak to her you are the lady we killed i think he asked gently she acknowledged with a bow that it was so we could none of us do anything he apologized or i hope you will believe certainly sir it was no fault of yours or indeed of the company's i am sure the accident was inevitable so she assured him smiling faintly he looked at her kindly there was blood on the hair he was able to convince himself but rory our pony never can pass things at the best of times and the look of your conveyance was certainly rather unusual and at that time of night we rarely meet anything at all on the great north road we choose that time on purpose my sister and i 
we had been staying away for a week with friends and we were going home when we saw you coming lucy said half in jest she is older than i suppose that thing in front were the coach of death the foolish country people talk about they say it travels this way once a year with its cargo of souls on st john's eve i bade her not to be superstitious but i confess i thought the vehicle looked odd myself and i did wonder how rory would stand it when it came nearer i saw distinctly that the coachman was headless and i laughingly told my sister so she bade me not disturb her for death coach or live coach she meant to do her best to get rory past it she failed the man in grey looked nervously around he was alone with the young lady in the dull inn-yard the headless coachman was preparing to ascend to the box-seat again where is your sister now he inquired she lies at the bottom of the ditch rory has galloped home she fell on her head but she is alive still when they find her in the morning she will be dead i know that for now i know all things i am at peace you need have no care for me let me at least put you into the coach he begged and you will prefer the corner seat she took it he went on it looks however as if you were going to have all the accommodation to yourself for this stage at all events he raised his hat she bowed i am grieved that i cannot have the pleasure that i cannot offer to accompany you but i have my marching orders he raised his hat again the coach moved on out of the yard soon it was lost in the mists the summer dawn was just breaking. End of section 8